Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Impact Theory. Today I'm going to be going through the topic of anxiety. Now, much to my dismay, this is a topic that I know a lot about. I am very intimate with anxiety as a lifestyle. Uh, there was a point in my life where I was completely debilitated by anxiety. That That is not an exaggeration. And today we're going to be going through some of the issues that I know that you guys are struggling with. And by the end, I hope that I can show you how you can get a handle on that and reverse that trend so that you can really move yourself out of that conquer anxiety and feel superhuman. And that's how I used to talk to myself was when I'm not anxious, I feel like a superhuman. But when I get anxiety, I actually feel the region of my brain shutting down. And the more I researched anxiety, the more I realized that is literally what is happening. There is an area of your brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for your higher level cognition, your decision making, future planning, all of that good stuff. And it literally goes offline because blood is leaving that region of the brain and going to the centers of your brain that handle fight or flight. So it is a diabolical syndrome, in my opinion, because it can take you from really feeling confident, grounded, and you have abilities that actually deteriorate and disappear when anxiety kicks in. And so putting in the work to get a hold of your anxiety is one of the most fruitful endeavors you will ever embark upon. So all I can tell you is that there was literally a time in my life where in a living room full of like five of my immediate family, I was so anxious, I couldn't tell a story that my wife was asking me to tell. I literally couldn't do it. I was like out of breath. It was so crazy. Like to think back to that time in my life uh, is really bizarre. And it felt hopeless. And so I'm here to tell you that there is hope. And as I often say, there's a process for that. So what we're going to be walking through today in answering some of the concerns that people have sent in is what is that process and how do we get a grip on our anxiety? All right, let's go. By the end of this, you guys are going to be powerhouses, or at least you're going to have the process by which to become a powerhouse. All right, number one, everyday tasks can be overwhelming and the anxiety of not completing tasks or the anxiety of feeling like a failure because you are going at a different pace compared to others. How do you control the mind once it's in the anxiety state and return back to the calm, more positive and motivating state? Thank you. Okay, so first of all, comparison is the thief of joy. So be careful just outright comparing yourself to other people. And in fact, Understanding what anxiety is at like its most foundational level, I think is going to be really helpful. Anxiety is simply, it is literally nothing more than this. It is simply you living in a future state, worrying about something that has not actually happened. And what you're doing is what I call rehearsing failure. So you're looking at somebody else, you're seeing how amazing they are, you're imagining your future and you're saying, you know, I'm never going to live up to what they've done. I'm never going to accomplish that level. Now, you can imagine that's very different than saying, oh, look at what they've done. That's so incredible. I'm super inspired and I'm going to get that good. I may not be that good yet, but I'm going to get that good. Now, one of those rehearsals creates anxiety that I'm never going to be that good. The other one reduces anxiety and it actually puts you in an action oriented state. Now, action cures all. That's one of my like just dead reckoning things that I say to myself all the time. Action cures all. So when you look at somebody that's killing it in a way that you want to kill it, step number one is to just recognize that you can get good. You can get better. That, that is just the nature of the human animal. You don't need to believe you're special. You just have to recognize the truth of the human condition. So anything you put energy and effort into getting better at, you will actually get better at. Anything that you rehearse over and over and over, anything you repeat is going to become real mentally. So if you look at someone else and say, I'm never going to be that, I'm never going to be that good, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, whatever, that's the thing that you repeat, you're catastrophizing, okay, to use the language of cognitive behavioral therapy, which you're not, if you're not familiar with that, that is the number one defense against anxiety. Read the book, Feeling Great. Uh, absolutely phenomenal book about how you stop the cognitive distortions, as they're known, and get into a state where you are in that calm state that you're looking for. 
Okay, so you interrupt that cognitive distortion of catastrophizing your future and you break the very link that allows anxiety to take hold. Because what's happening ultimately is your brain is calorically ravenous. Okay, your brain weighs about three pounds and takes up like 20 or 25% of the energy usage of the entire body. Okay, that's freakish unto itself. Now, because it's so calorically ravenous, it is also extremely conservative in terms of if you do something a lot, it wants to make sure that it makes that easier. And so what it does, there's this phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. So what's happening is you're rehearsing failure, you're rehearsing catastrophe, your brain goes, oh, okay, cool. This anxiety feeling that we have, this thought about, ooh, the future is this really dangerous thing, I need to hardwire that. I need to make it easier to think these thoughts about the danger coming in the future. I need to make it easier neurochemically, like literally it is easier for the electrical chemical signals to traverse between the synapses because it's wrapping it in what's called a process of myelination. So it's wrapping this fatty tissue between those connection points. Okay, that's the wire together part of neurons that fire together, wire together. So now you have this myelination and the brain's like, ah, I'm so much more efficient at thinking and feeling this rehearsal of failure. And so what starts as a somewhat minor concern about not being as cool as the next person, not accomplishing as much as they do, not being as smart or as talented, whatever, and it becomes this full-blown, I mean, this can really go into like full-blown panic attack syndrome because you're repeating it. The more you feel it, the higher the anxiety, so it's a positive feedback loop. So I feel anxious about this, which makes me more anxious about this, which makes me think about it and worry about it more. And so now my brain is wiring it and the amplitude is going up. And so when you get into a positive feedback loop like that, that's destructive, now you're in a really dangerous place. So step number one, don't compare yourself in to others in a way other than I could become that with enough time and energy and effort put into it. And then number two, recognize that when you have a cognitive distortion like catastrophizing, I'll never be that good, right? You don't have evidence to support that. And even if you do, it does not serve you to spend time catastrophizing. So you are way better off just from a neurochemical standpoint, you are way better off doing what's called a pattern interrupt, stopping yourself from thinking that. And instead of saying, so the nice simple pattern interrupt here, oh, I'm never gonna be that good. Wait, pattern interrupt, I'm not that good yet, but I can get that good, okay? And that becomes the way that you break that cycle. And the only way to undo that anxiety is to let it atrophy. Now, the fastest way to make something atrophy is to focus on something else. So now the thing that we're going to replace that catastrophizing with that's hardwiring into our brain is we're going to replace it with the way the human animal works. I can get good at anything, right? So if it's what I call the only belief that matters, if I put time and attention into getting better at this thing, I will actually get better. That is the nature of the human animal. And so I would just repeat that. I can get good at anything. I can get good at anything. And so that becomes my pattern interrupt. That becomes the thing now that I'm reinforcing in my mind. That becomes the thought that hardwires. That becomes the feeling that hardwires. And now all of a sudden, when I encounter somebody that's doing something better than me, that's outpacing me, whatever the case, that's raising my anxiety levels and I want to get back to that calm state, I'm going to pattern interrupt that and I'm going to repeat now something that empowers me and makes me feel better. And by doing that, now I'm reinforcing something that makes me feel good, that makes me feel expansive versus contracting. So it makes me feel expansive, like I can tackle the challenge and that's what I'm going to hardwire. That was a game changer for me. So I highly encourage you guys to put massive amounts of time and energy every single day to hardwiring that expansive thought and letting the contracting thoughts, the anxiety provoking thoughts diminish over time just by atrophying because you don't allow yourself to think about them. All right, next, how do you deal with the physical effects of anxiety like adrenaline? I am so glad you asked. So this is where meditation comes in 
if you guys have been listening to me for a while, you've probably heard me say that meditation saved my life. And while I was never clinically depressed, I will say that the anxiety was getting so bad that if I were to carry that out another year or two years, I could see it really being um, very problematic. And the most distressing period of my life came about, I don't know, a year or two after I started meditating. So I just cannot stress enough how powerful it is to recognize what I call physiological hooks. So there are physiological hooks into the brain, into your neurochemistry, into adrenaline pumping, cortisol pumping, so that you can change your neurochemistry. And I'm obsessed with this idea. You can change your neurochemistry consciously. Now, how do I know that's true? And if you don't believe me, what do you think the odds are that I can prove it to you in a single sentence where you will believe at the end of that sentence that Tom is right? I can consciously control my neurochemistry. Go ahead, lock in your answer. Now, here it is. For anybody that doesn't believe that you can consciously control your neurochemistry, I'm going to give you two sentences. Option number one, this is the most immediately profound. Put on that song that makes you feel hyphy. You can't help it. The second you put that song on, your neurochemistry is going to change. Number two, studies have shown that even if you fake a smile, that smile, merely holding your face in the position of a smile will change your neurochemistry. Now, this one I deployed very early in my life. It's one of the most profound things I've used in my marriage, which is when you get really pissed off, you're angry about something, you're anxious, whatever. If you force yourself to laugh out loud, you will feel utterly ridiculous. But if you force yourself to laugh out loud, you will feel the neurochemistry change. Now, anxiety is tough. And if you spent all the time hardwiring it, when you're laughing, you will feel an alleviation of the symptoms. And then as you stop, you're going to feel them start creeping back. But I want you guys to get used to doing things like that so that you realize you can control at will your neurochemistry. Now, once you believe that it can be done, now we can get into doing things that have really, um, they stack, that the more you do it, the more control you get, the better you get at dealing with anxiety over time. And the most profound thing, I have not found anything that is as phenomenal with dealing with anxiety than meditation. Now, the physiological hook is that you're breathing from your diaphragm. It really is that stupid simple. Like a faking a smile can change your neurochemistry. Breathing from your diaphragm is profound. And I remember the first time I consciously took a diaphragmatic breath. It was a game changer. It literally, in that moment, I was like, what is happening? So the reason meditation works is you're having a biological experience. Meditation is a physiological hook to consciously take control of your biology. So you're going to sit in a comfortable space. You're going to breathe from your belly. Okay, that's what we mean when we say a diaphragm breath. So you're going to breathe way down low, like you're trying to make yourself look fat. Okay, you're going to breathe low in the belly. When you first start doing it, it feels really unnatural, but it feels really good. And so you just breathe from your diaphragm, breathe low from your belly. Okay, what I just did is a really high breath. That, that in fact, not only will it not lower your anxiety, if you're breathing really shallow up high, that's a physiological hook to trigger anxiety because what's happening is that is associated with the fight or flight mode. Okay, so if you do the physiological thing that's related to what's called the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, then you're going to feel that. If you do the things related to the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, then you're going to feel that. And they exist on a seesaw. You cannot be both calm and anxious at the same time. You either are anxious or you are calm. There's not going to be the two at the same time ever. So it's a negative feedback loop. So as you sit down and meditate and you breathe diaphragmatically, for whatever reason, evolution has given us that physiological hook that will work whether you want it to or not. You breathe from your belly. You will feel your anxiety lower. And if you're not feeling it, this is one of those where you need to practice learning how to breathe effectively from your belly because it's not a, a maybe it works. 
It is, it will work every time. And what I've learned in my life is I'm never more than 45 minutes away from total equanimity. Now, what do I mean by that? There are times where when I sit down to meditate, it only takes me two minutes, five minutes to slip into just totally calm and peaceful, no background radiation. So no adrenaline, no cortisol, no sense of stress, no sense of anxiety, no impending doom, none of that. I just immediately slip into feeling good. But there have been times in my life where the stress levels are so high and the there is so much on the line. There have been times in my life where I'm dealing in hundreds of millions of dollars. And at those moments, as you can imagine, anxiety is through the roof. And what I learned is even in those times where it's like crazy stressful and my biology is going nuts, my adrenaline is pumping, the blood has left my prefrontal cortex, it's all doom and gloom. All I can see is a future where everything is bad. I'm catastrophizing the life out of everything. If I sit down and diaphragmatically breathe, coming back to the breath, meaning I don't allow myself to just you know, let my mind wander to the things that I'm worried about. Every time I catch myself, I come back to the breath, breathing from my belly. Now, when I'm really stressed, it takes a long time. But by 45 minutes, no matter how much stress has ever been present in my life, I have never needed more than 45 minutes of diaphragmatic breathing to get back to total calm, no sense of stress or anxiety. Now, there have been times where it will take me 45 minutes to get back to that. And two, two hours later, I'm back to stressed out. And during those periods, I made sure that I had time two or three times a day to meditate. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, meditation stacks. So the more you do it, the better you get at it, the less time it takes, the more your brain actually begins to change. And there are regions of the brain that actually grow larger, more dense in response to meditation. In fact, you can scan somebody's brain and if they are a lifetime meditator, you can actually tell the difference just by the structures of their brain if they're a long time meditator or a non-meditator. That's pretty extraordinary when you think that what meditation is doing is allowing you to get control of that biology, to move yourself from the sympathetic fight or flight to the parasympathetic rest and digest where you feel nice and calm. So there are many physiological hooks, but that is the prime one. So um, if you don't know how to meditate, go look up Mark Divine Box Breathing. It's a very simple method of meditation. It's where I started um, and it was a game changer for me. So yeah, don't sleep on meditation, man. Next, what are some ways to snap out of social related anxiety, i.e. going to the gym, bar, etc.? Okay, so again, what is anxiety? Anxiety is you are catastrophizing about the future. So I'm guessing if you're worried about going to the gym, you're thinking, oh my God, they're going to judge me. They're going to think I'm a loser. I'm fat. I'm weak. I'm skinny. I'm whatever your concern is. You've got to pattern interrupt that. You've got to stop it. You've got to focus on not what other people think about you. You've got to focus on what your goal is. And if your goal demands that you go to a gym, if you want to be more social and your goal demands that you go out and meet people, then that's what we're going to do. So we're going to do whatever we have to in order to get beyond that sense of like, this is a terrible thing. So now this is where we put our meditation in. This is where we stop our catastrophizing. We do the pattern interrupt. We start thinking about, oh man, this is gonna be great. I'm not good at social stuff yet, but I'm gonna get good. Tom told me action cures all, so I know I need to go do this thing. There's nothing to panic about because the only thing that you're quote unquote panicking about is some future thing that's going to happen. But what's really going to happen? Let's say everybody judges you. They, they think that you are a loser. They think that you are fat. They think that you are skinny. They think that you are dumb, whatever. Now, did you die or do you survive that? And more importantly, do you get a little bit better, a little stronger, a little more resilient? It's really easy to think about when you think about going to the gym. If everyone there thinks that you are fat or skinny or whatever, but you show up to the gym every day and you put in the work, they cannot stop you from getting the result that you want. So they can throw all the shade they want, which by the way, they're not. Nobody gives a shit about anybody 
else, to be honest. Like, they might give you a sideways glance and think you're a loser, but they're worried about themselves. They're thinking about themselves. They're trying to look cool or feel good or be proud of themselves or move forward in their life or whatever. And the odds that they're spending any significant amount of time thinking about you is basically zero. So the great news is no matter what they're thinking about you, they cannot stop you from getting the result that you want when you show up and put in the work. So focusing on getting a little bit better every day, that's really the goal. So whatever your goal is, it mandates certain actions. The good news is action cures all. The even better news is that you can interrupt that escalation mentally with a pattern interrupt, with a focus on the fact that you can get better, reminding yourself of empowering statements instead of disempowering statements. And then you just get to work. Just do the thing. And every time your brain starts worrying about the future, remind yourself, if I let myself sit here and think about this, this will become the easiest thought for me to think. This will become the easiest feeling for me to feel which means that when my brain walks into a gym or a bar or whatever, I will have trained it to trigger over into this negativity. And so that's why we wanna use the empowering thoughts as mental jujitsu. So now crossing the threshold into the gym or to the bar or to the party or whatever is the habit loop trigger to say something empowering to ourselves on repeat. To remember to smile, to remember to breathe from our diaphragm, to remember to interrupt with our own just internal voice. I don't allow myself to think that. I literally say that to myself all the time. I don't allow that. I am not going to think about that anymore. And I force myself to say in my head something empowering. It's so weird how effective that is. It just works. You will become whatever you repeat. If you repeat, oh my God, I'm so anxious, this is terrible. Whenever I go to a party, like, oh my God, I feel terrible. My anxiety spirals, I have panic attacks. Then that's what's going to happen because you keep repeating it. And your brain goes, oh, okay. We think this thought a lot. We feel this feeling a lot. We need to reinforce it. So break that pattern. All right, next, where does anxiety come from? Sometimes I feel it and I don't know why. All right, this is known as generalized anxiety disorder. Now, generalized anxiety means that you have so many triggers now for your anxiety. I'll give you one of mine. This was so bizarre to me. This was when I first thought, ooh, I don't think I'm nervous. I don't think I'm a nervous person. I think this has officially reached levels of anxiety. If I turned So I used to work in a parking garage where, you know, you would go up to floor five or whatever. And every day I would just turn right, turn right, turn right, turn right, all the way down. But you could turn right or left. And I remember one day, for whatever reason, I turned left and I had this sudden spike of anxiety. And I was like, why the hell would I be anxious about turning left? And so that was when I realized, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like this isn't even now attached to any sort of major thing. This is about me overextending, doing something new, going into the unknown. And I realized that that was the beginning of the anxiety for me, that because I'm not a born entrepreneur, getting into business was this incredibly anxiety provoking endeavor. The stakes were so high. I felt like I was constantly on stage, like it was nuts. And so I realized, oh my God, anytime I do something quote unquote out of my comfort zone, no matter how minor, my brain has now allowed itself to condition itself to be anxious about anything that sort of deviated from the norm. And when we boil it back down to what is anxiety? Anxiety is living in the future and worrying about it, okay? You're mentally projecting into the future and you are worried about it. And you allow yourself, yes, allow yourself to worry. And it feels like, it feels like you're doing yourself a solid because you're thinking through all the things that could go wrong. So you want to be ready. I remember I used to, okay, I'm going to get in, you know, this situation in a meeting or whatever. And at some point the eyes are going to turn to me. So what do I do if my heart starts racing and I'm getting panicky? What do I do about that? And I realized that I would sit there and be like, okay, I'm going to, you know, maybe I can say that I've got a stomach ache or a headache or something and I'll find a way out of the room. 
all I was doing in those moments was rehearsing it going wrong, that I was going to get into this situation and need an exit. And then I realized, you know, a better approach, because all my planning to make sure that I'm ready is the thing that's making me anxious. Okay. I, I, I want that to hit home. That is the thing that's making you anxious is that you're thinking about you might get anxious. Like I remember when I was young and I first started experiencing nerves and I remember thinking the only thing that I'm nervous about is other people realizing that I'm nervous. Like if I knew that my nerves were invisible, I wouldn't worry about it. But it was always that sense of like, oh, is my face going to turn red? Am I going to sound out of breath? Is my voice going to quiver? And worrying about it was the very thing that made it happen. And so I began to realize a big part of getting out of this anxiety death loop was going to be to never again rehearse failure. And so I started saying to myself, let failure surprise you. So when I succeed, I'm never surprised because I rehearsed the shit at a success. I, and think about Olympic athletes. They talk about visualization, right? I would visualize this is going to go well. I'm going to kill it. I would remember the times, even when there were very few of them, I would remember the times where, A, this went really well. It went exactly like I thought. Oftentimes it would be because I would get caught off guard. And so I wouldn't have time to worry about it. Somebody would just ask me something. I would answer and I'd be like, oh my God, the answer was actually really good. And I realized, okay, if I don't know what's coming, I can just get into the flow. So I'm like, this isn't even a skill set problem. This is a, I'm worried about not performing well problem. And so once you understand all anxiety is, is a physiological response to you worrying about the future. So your brain goes, whoa, fight or flight. We're in it. This is dangerous. And it has ancient mechanisms for dealing with that. And those ancient mechanisms take over. And so I stopped rehearsing failure. I started rehearsing success and I just said, I'm going to let failure take me totally by surprise if it ever happens, because I'm never going to allow myself to think about it. And so now anytime I find myself like, Ooh, that could be like a risky situation. I say to myself, no, no, no. This is an opportunity for me to shine. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to get out there. I'm prepared. I was prepare myself. You know that you're ready to rock and roll. Let's do the damn thing. And because that's what I start repeating in my head. Now, when I think about something like that, I'm not nervous. I've rehearsed that feeling good. I say those things to myself in an elevated state. So I'm excited about them. And so now all of a sudden I'm rehearsing this feeling good. I'm rehearsing it being fun. And so that's what comes to mind when I enter what used to be a very stressful situation. All right. Since anxiety is always there, what is one way we can use anxiety to our benefit? All right. So this is actually a really interesting question. So any emotion, anxiety, fear, anger, rage, um, all of them actually serve an evolutionary purpose. So anxiety, when it's mild, is actually very useful because it makes you take things seriously. It makes sure that you're prepared. It makes sure, like, for instance, with my schedule. I have just enough anxiety that I won't be prepared for something that I check my calendar in the morning. I make sure that I understand what's going on that day so that I can make sure that I'm prepared for it. And my whole sort of modus operandi in life is to be prepared for things, to be well-researched, to, you know, study, to um, rehearse that success, all of that. And that actually is born out of that just little bit of anxiety of like, hey, I could really do something special here. This could be amazing, but I need to take it seriously. And so when it's that, it actually is my friend. And so at that sort of useful level, I express gratitude. I will welcome emotions as old friends. I will actually say, welcome back, old friend. I used to do this with hunger all the time when I was really getting lean. I would say, ah, welcome back, hunger. I know that you were here because I am burning fat. And so I am so grateful for your return. And so when anxiety is at that useful level, it's, you know, welcome back, old friend. This is amazing. And then once I start thinking about something going wrong, no nope, pattern interrupt. I don't allow myself to think that. Absolutely not. I can get better at anything. I can do this. It's going to be amazing. Look at all the ways that it's going to go right. So you have to get pretty deft at understanding how to handle that. But that movement is there for you. So just keep that in mind. All right. Can a body be so used to anxiety after years of being triggered 
that always being tense is normal, even at times when the mind is fine and relaxed. Yes, this is generally generalized anxiety disorder. This is where you're just, your brain is so used to slipping into this negative mindset that it goes there very easily, like me turning left. And if you recognize that, okay, I understand how this works. This is through repetition. This was me worrying about the future, worrying, 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 catastrophizing, having all these essentially lies that I'm telling myself, I'm never going to be that good. Uh, this is going to be terrible. I'm never going to work again, whatever the you know list. I forget how many cognitive distortions are, but there's something like 15. And one of them is fortune telling, right? Oh man, I'm going to go in there. This is going to be terrible. They're going to eat me alive. Okay, that's fortune telling. You don't know that. Go in, do your best. That's all that you can ask of yourself, right? If you've prepared for it and you put in the time and the energy and you go in and you fail, so be it. And here's the great news. Failure is the most information-rich data stream in the world. This is why Tom says that action cures all. You have to go out there and figure it out. As you're engaging with something, especially when you fail, you get all this information back. And so when you've got this information back, now you can leverage that to get a little bit better. And since one of the OG pattern interrupts is I can get better at anything, then you're gonna say, oh, cool. I've got this information. I can now get better. I can now progress. But you have to be willing to go through that process so that you can begin to let things atrophy, the anxiety atrophy. Because if you're you know, in your 20s and you've spent the last 10 years looping on these things that make you anxious, or if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s and you've got decades behind you of putting in that work to hardwire the stuff, one, no, the way the brain works, just by default, you are not special. The way your brain works, the human brain, you can unwire that by putting your time and energy into repeating things about getting better, about the ability to improve. And if you just spend your time on that, then you'll be just fine. But if you allow yourself to keep investing in the anxiety, not doing the pattern interrupts, remember, read the book, Feeling Great by David D. Burns, okay? Read that book. It takes you step by step on how to use cognitive behavioral therapy to begin to, um, not begin to, to immediately, immediately stop all the cognitive distortions and future worry that are creating that anxiety. It's incredibly powerful. Now, when you shift it to putting that same time and energy into rehearsing success, into doing the things you need to do to actually get better at something, now all of a sudden you've got all these expansive thoughts and they make you feel better. Now you combine that with meditation. Now you're able to lower that anxiety that's sort of ever present. It's what I call background radiation. Okay, so you're lowering that to zero. And now you're replacing it with these expansive thoughts that make you feel better. And now all of a sudden, the anxiety begins to atrophy. You begin to feel better over time. Now it does take time. You have to focus on this new empowering way of thinking long enough that the old ways begin to atrophy. So please do not be self-defeated and add another worry to your plate and say, oh my God, like this might work for other people, but it does not work for me. You just have to keep at it. You have to keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. The diaphragm breath will give you some amount of immediate relief. Every time I do that, even right now, it just feels good. So learn to diaphragm breathe and then keep repeating empowering notions, pattern interrupting negative emotions, using things that used to be a, an anxiety trigger now as a habit loop trigger to your new habit which is to think an empowering thought, to take an empowering action, to do something like breathe from your diaphragm, the physiological hooks, so that you can master your anxiety. And that ultimately is what we're talking about. You can do it. I know because I've put in the work for a very long time. Now, it's something I think about frequently. It's not something that, at least in my experience, that, oh, now I don't have to think about it. I certainly don't have the debilitating anxiety that I did. Um, but by being just on top of thinking the empowering things and doing the meditation and all of that, my life has completely changed. So guys, gals, put in the work. You will get the result. I promise you can master your anxiety. 
All right, my friends, I hope this added value to you. If it did, make sure that you smash the like button, make sure that you are subscribed and that you don't miss a thing. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, be sure to smash that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so you never miss a thing. Till next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care.